Hello there. This is once again Jana coming to you from the future to apologize for what you're about to hear. The quality, not the content. We don't know what happened exactly. The audio on my side must have gotten corrupted or something. It already starts out kind of rough and then just deteriorates into sounding like I'm calling in from a landline. We haven't encountered this problem before or since, as you could tell from our session zero and the teasers we posted. None of which were from episode one. For reasons. Again, this is exclusively an episode one thing. This doesn't happen again so far. Our audio quality isn't the greatest, but it's better than what you are about to hear. The same goes for the background noises. There's a lot of obnoxious clicking and creaking towards the beginning of the episode. We have gotten way better about that too. Just preventing it while recording and editing it out. And we get better about it over the course of this episode. So if you find yourself extremely annoyed with all the noises in the beginning, skip ahead like half an hour or so. You still get most of the episode out of it and it's just a lot less grating. So, despite all of this, I really hope you get some enjoyment out of what you're about to hear. And I also hope that I'm going to see you all for episode 2 when we publish it on November 17th. Bye! Hello and welcome to Critical Rollback. I'm Bong. My name is Jana. Uh, and welcome to Critical Rollback, the uh, podcast where you can leave your comment cards at the door. Yes, if you haven't done so already, we strongly advise you to go back and listen to our episode zero. Maybe not the whole thing, but we go over stuff like trigger warnings. And so on, they won't be repeating, so do that. Yes. Please actually check out Section Zero if you can. Uh, but if not, we will just be jumping into Episode 1 of Critical Role, Arrival at Craghammer. Episode 1, Campaign 1, first published in... Uh, March 12th, March 12th of 2015. But before you do that, uh -huh. check out our super cute art. We have an icon, we have a banner, you're a goose, I'm, I'm a an goose. Allura cosplay. <laughs> you're, an Allura, you're a red Allura, it's very cute. There's yes. This very cute art was made by our friend. Yes, thanks and shout out to our to our good friend of the show, uh, Lulafia, who you can find at Lulafia on Tumblr and at Tyuru, that's at T-Y-U-R-R-U on Twitter, where you can tell her how awesome our art is. And maybe commission her for to do some art for you. Yes, please give her money. Give her all of the money. All of the money you're not giving us. Come all give, of your Give her your money wealth. first. Anyway. Yes. It's a very cute art. It's very good art. It makes me happy it to is. see. I'm a goofy girl. Yeah, yeah. Before we begin the recap of the episode in full, I would like to go over some of the content warnings of this episode. Within this episode, episode 1 of Campaign 1, Arrival at Craghammer, there are several content warnings that might be necessary for certain viewers. For example, there is a not in extreme detail but slightly detailed depiction of sexual content in the brothel scene with uh, Scanlan and Grog. Um, there's also a reference, but not a depiction, of attempted rape by a troll against Tiberius. Uh, this is referenced in regards to uh, something that happened pre-live stream. Uh, and finally, towards the end of the episode, there is a battle encounter in which uh, several civilians are killed, and also several goblins and trolls, which are depicted within Critical Role proper as being sapient and capable of complex emotions, are killed while attempting to flee. Uh, if this is something that 
is emotionally harmful to you or could stress you, just know that before going in. Thank you. Hello. Once again, before we begin, I would like to give you a few spoiler warnings about some of the content that we discuss in this episode. Obviously, we spoil episode one of campaign one, that is granted. Uh, we also, as stated in session zero, spoil the entirety of campaign one. We just regard it as one complete piece. Uh, but in addition to this, we actually also spoil a little bit of campaign two by speaking of um, Beauregard's backstory. So if that is something that you are avoiding, make note of that. Thank you very much. And now, recap. Where we so, will first of all look at out of game tidbits, such as the fact that everyone looks about a decade younger. Everyone looks like a tiny baby, except except for Liam. Yeah, I was going to say except for Liam. Exactly, Liam actually looks it's older. Some of his haircut makes him older. Yeah, he looks like he looks like he is in his mid forties this episode, and I don't think he is actually. No, no, he's I think early forties. He looks older than he does now. Has he absorbed all of their youth? It's not to say that the cast looks old now, but <laughs> they look positively baby. They look positively baby. I will say that it's, they don't look older now, but they look more distinguished now. They look like... Oh, that's a nice way of putting it. Distinguished. They look wizened, like like known sages. Uh, battle-hardened. Yeah, they look battle-hardened, world-weary. Another thing that's worth mentioning about this episode, other than the, the cast's beautiful faces, is being that this is the first episode, the, the audio is um, broken at the very start. And for a bit and for a bit later on. For a bit later on, they, they have to get it under control. Uh, that's So, I mean, I think that there's a lot of complaints about the, the audio, but it's not actually quite that bad. I didn't find it as less... I mean, if you listen to, w- with it, to it on headphones, it's probably okay. Without headphones, I found it hard to hear Matt most of the time. Yeah, it's a Which I've muddy. seen referenced in the on-screen chat they have going on. Yep. That uh, Matt really, really needs his own microphone. Yeah, it's... It, uh, you have, like, a, a screenshot of one of the, the comments to say that... The, you know, <laughs> uh, the chat yes. is actually surprisingly sweet, despite it being... A, I mean... There's like five people in there. This is the first episode. Geek and Sundry wasn't big, and Critical Role had its very first episode. They are still filming on the very old set that looks like someone's bedroom. It does look it like someone's It isn't, I know, but it looks very homey. It does. Which isn't even a bad thing. I kind of like the vibe. I do. I do like the vibe. I think it's a little bit weird, and it's probably not very conducive to a good sound escape, but it is kind of cute. Yeah. Yeah, also, we start the episode not with an opening, but with a narration from every single character about their backgrounds for, for like three minutes and blurred out pictures for copyright reasons. Yeah, yeah. How do we feel about the, the character introductions? I mean, there are a lot. Like, I understand that they were, that they were trying to go for, um, they were trying to. to get the audience to know who the characters are, but if you could just get eight people introduced to you back to back to back to back to back, it's a lot. You're not going to be taking much in. Yeah, it's a little hard to absorb. Uh, but they do play that clip several times. I think they play it over during the break. Uh, and Yeah, they play it during the break. They play it before every episode until they have an opening. Uh-huh. They might even play it after they have an opening. Yeah, they're, they really stick to these. I think the one thing that's a little bit strange is the um, the inconsistency of whether somebody speaks in first person or third person. Yeah, that's a little weird. Also, something else that is going to kind of confuse the viewer is that there is a difference. What a hell of a difference between the performing as character in voiceover voices and they're actually playing the character on the show voices. Yeah, that's something that comes up also, I remember, in... Um... What is the, the the game that they did uh, DLC characters for? P- P- not 
not DLC characters, Pillars of Eternity. You had okay, the critical role parts were um, POs were um, DLC characters that were just also free. Yes. Um, but yeah, those had also had like stock lines recorded. We will be talking about Pillars of Eternity again. Um, they had stock lines recorded and portraits in the game, which is why I played way more of the second game than of the first. Um, where it was also very apparent that if they are told to, you know, do their job and be this character in a voiceover, the voices are a lot more, a lot more performance than when they are just playing, when the accents are usually there. Mm-hmm. There's not like, they don't like speak entirely different and out of character, but it's a little more natural, a little softer, a little less, this word is odd here. But I'm going to use it anyway, a little less performative. Yes. Um, They're a little bit more lived in. Yes. Especially the more I feel. Per- a person talking. It's just a person talking and not uh, a person talking in a video game or a, yeah. probably a cartoon. If I had to make the spectrum, it's actually a very odd spectrum, I'd say that like Percy tends to be at a high level of like sounds kind of weird recorded. Really? Yeah, a little bit. Also, Grog. I think Grog is actually the, the most weird recorded. Yeah, that was what I was gonna say. Grog is like Travis really leans into the Grog sound more than he does in just regular role play. Yes, I agree completely. I think it, it sounds very much like a uh, like a tavern NPC, like somebody you'd meet in like a video game bar. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. Probably <laughs> the least performed are actually like. Vex is pretty good, Keyleth is pretty rough, uh, and Scanlan, as much as I hate to compliment him, actually does sound kind of natural. Yeah, Scanlan narration sounds natural, but For also Scanlan. different from show Scanlan. Yes, it sounds like performance Scanlan, but I think it's something that comes up with like the, the nature of the bard, which is like, we've seen... Yes. Yeah, we've heard Scanlan be a performance Scanlan before, so you can very much identify Scanlan in the voiceover and recorded lines as performance Scanlan, which is different from normal speaking Scanlan, but it still like exists in universe. I mean, it's also helpful that you could actually see Scanlan walking up to someone in a bar and actually talking to them like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't think you can imagine Grog walking up to someone in the gro- in a, like a bar and, and talking to them like that. I mean, to be fair, also. None of the other people are going to just divulge their um, tragic backstories this way. I mean, which leads me to a fun observation <laughs> that I get the feeling that nobody, that the cast didn't watch each other's videos. Why do you say like this? Like you can, um, because things come up during these narrations that come and in play into the story later, and everyone seems to have no idea. Maybe they're just very good actors. I mean, they are. Um, <laughs> but. For example, Percy's entire backstory is um, retold for dramatic effect later on and um, seems like completely new information to everyone, which again might just be acting, the thing they do. Yeah, it's strange. I, I really don't know where to yeah. place it. And information about Scanlan's mother that comes up this episode and then not for 85 episodes. <laughs> I do think they actually know about that. They they don't seem to have pretended to not know about that, at least. Marisha knows about it in this episode. She's like, well, do, don't you have a thing with goblins? That's and true. that is, like, drowned out by general combat noises and never comes up again. Never comes up again. Which yeah. we'll have words about when we make it to that episode. Maybe. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. We'll have a lot to Okay, so that, that's, so. that's the whole lot of information up front. And that's, uh, I, I think that's pretty much all of the out-of-game tidbits that I can think of. Yeah, pretty much. There's not that much going on with the set yet, it's kind of bare bones, but it doesn't look it's bad. It's functional. It's, it's functional. It's fine. The overlay is actually not as busy as it will be. That's true, like, I, I usually, I kind of want to say that it's less busy because the chat doesn't just go a mile a minute yet. You can actually read what's happening. Yeah, and there's oh. no, like, announcements popping in and out, yes. Yes, and related to that, I did take a screenshot of the chat once where somebody called the person on the bottom left Bay, which happens to be Talison oh, in full stealth mode. Talison. He <laughs> looks like the most nondescript man you can imagine. Mm-hmm. 
And like knowing in retrospect, because he did talk later about, of course, this is personal information for the players, but he did talk about uh, for being on, uh, on like them iterating in the middle of like new medication, swapping medication. I don't know where you have this. I don't know where you have this information from, and it is news to me. I do remember him talking about that. this. I will have to find where he's, like actual background for this, but I remember him uh, talking about this specifically, and that like. I can't remember exactly what he said, but the, the, the part of the reason why he was so quiet over the first two episodes was, was just like a medication swap. To some oh, extent. that might have been in one of those Q and A's they used to do after the shows. Yeah, where they just sit on a couch and answer chat questions as they arise. Yes, I just made it may have been the good old days. Issues. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, he did. I do remember him talking about just like. Yeah, that's why I was quiet in the first few episodes. It was just like new medication time, and, and having been myself on on new medication before, that has like some some significant side effects. Uh, I get it. That is very much like how you're just sinking into the couch. I mean, there are some quality Percy moments in this episode. There are. Like, I will say that if if, if this is him on on medication side effects, like <laughs> it's pretty good. It's better than I would do. Okay, so um, I think that's it for the out of game tidbits. Mm-hmm. Finally. Finally. <laughs> so this is where we would usually do a section where we just get you up to speed on what has happened on the show so far. However, it is literally episode one. Yes. It is quite literally the beginning. And, and it's worth mentioning that we are going with the video format of, of what happened before uh, in the pre stream Yeah. We joined these characters at level 9, and they've been an adventuring party for 9 levels already. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to information of what happened before them, before the stream to get them here, they published on Christmas of 2015, for the Christmas episode, a video with narration by the cast themselves, in their best performance voices, um, with art from fans recounting the events up to that point. Um, it should, should still be available in episode 36, and there's a subtitled version now available on YouTube, and it's, and it's called The Story of Vox Machina. We will be referring to this video as what we consider canon to have happened before the stream, because the comics um, which exist and cover these events too take some liberties. While this is not necessarily a, a judgment of those comics, it is actually, sorry, we are judging these comics, but we'll, we'll try not to get too it. We are, right but now. that's beside the point. That's beside the point. We just, it, for simplicity's sake, and also because, I mean, like, you don't have to pay to see the the preview, it's for free. Yes. So it's just it's, Like, it's, when there is a situation where the comic delivers contradictory information, we are going to go with the video. Yeah, the more readily available source uh, that seems to be a little bit more cohesive. Uh, and with less, like, the comics came out in 2017, I think? Yes. After they'd already produced hours upon hours upon hours of content. Mm-hmm. And the video was at the end of the first year, so at the end of 2015. So there's a, there's some separation there, and the video just feels closer to the source, and with no need to maybe split up the party to balance out some characters. Yeah, there's no need to tell a... a... A sellable, cohesive, deliberate... It is cohesive. The story is still cohesive. It's just... It retcons stuff sometimes. It, it is, but I think it's just... In the video, there's it's just a plain explanation, whereas the comics need to be good as a comic. Yes, and again, have concerns with, oh, do we really need eight char- characters on screen at this time? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a legitimate concern to have when you're ma- making a comic. It's just too sad that they chose to split the party the way they did. Yep. Contradicting information that has been well established on the show. Yeah. Yes. I agree with this. This was supposed to be short. This was supposed to be short. We will get into the things that we have during the actual episodes. But this is just episode one, so that's all you need to know. Is Hi. This yes. is the beginning. So Yes, they are arriving at Crackhammer, which is the name of the episode. But why are they in Crackhammer Ball? They are in Crackhammer because they are hot on the trail of a halfling paladin named Dikima who disappeared into the Underdark recently and uh, they were sent by their their dear friend Oro who has a relationship of some nature 
to this halfling paladin, uh, and they are have gone after. I, I think they do. They know at this point that that she's on like a spirit quest. Uh, yeah, they know that she's on a vision quest. That's what they keep saying, at least. Yeah, she's on a, a quest for her god Bahamut. To... There's something brewing in the mines that Bahamut doesn't like. Mm-hmm. So that's why they have gone to Crack Hammers to uh, start the search for this uh, famous little halfling named Hima. Uh, and we start Crack Hammer by immediately going into a pub. Well, not quite immediately. We first have to. They almost get it. They first ask for a pub or like a place to sleep, and then get hazed by dwarves at the entryway until Vex bribes them. That's true. Which is a very well, good character establishing money. moment for, for Vex. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of funny. They have this whole thing where they're like, oh, but who speaks Dwarvish? Pike speaks Dwarvish. Pike isn't here. Tiberius speaks Dwarvish. And then the dwarves are like, we speak common and Vex speaks Dwarvish because she's paying us. <laughs> yep. Vex definitely speaks, dwarf, speaks Dwarvish. She speaks Dwarvish fluently and... Readily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so after that, they go into the pub, yes? Yes. They then proceed to continue to speak Dwarvish by buying everyone around. Or Vax, actually. Vax, is, around. Vax starts a party. It's just party people in the house. Yes. Around for everyone and just loud declarations. And also, uh, the first thing that happens is actually that Grog goes in there, they get side-eyed, Grog flexes at some dwarves, and the dwarves buy him a drink. Again, I'm going to get into this more on the, the detail, but I do have some thoughts about this might be a gay bar. <laughs> so it was like a vibe bar. we got by we watching. Some of these interactions are maybe a little gay. Maybe a little gay. It's absolutely not the intention here, but yeah. It's Anyways, so they talk like... to... Yes, mm-hmm. go ahead. They talk to the owner of the bar, and she points them... Well, they ask her about the t- about the halfling, and she points them towards the gray spines on their minds. And um, they only talk to Borgus after, right? Yeah, they only talk yeah, to Borgus after. Yeah, I'm pretty sure after. the... Because um... he's asleep on the bar. No, no, wait, 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 no, they do talk to him here. Yes, they do. Actually, they do. Like, they're still in full party mode, and Grog is still being the life of the party, and then they discover they were sent to this bulbous dude who's drunk and sleeping at the bar, uh-huh. and they talk to him about the gray spines and try to get some information out of him. Mm-hmm. Like, the initial plan was to have Grog sweet talk him, but then, uh,. <laughs> Grog is like, I'm going. I'm just going to throw him at boobs, and boobs. The boobs are vexes, and Keyleth is also there, but mostly vex. Yes. Again, I still think that this would have worked better if Grog had tried to sweet talk him because I don't think Bogus is very. Probably. Bogus isn't very receptive to boobs. I mean, he also wanted to fight the guy. Mm-hmm. But that, that where, may have also which been is where flirting. we get the. Uh, hmm? That may have also been flirting. <laughs> uh. Yes. <laughs> very much so. This is also where we get the get the amazing line. I have an intelligence of six. I know what I'm doing from. <laughs> no, yeah, so the flirting with Borgus is very, very cringe. So very cringe. So very cringe. Especially when Tiberius tries to... Try to also... <laughs> he doesn't try to flirt. He just buffoons in there and then wins the encounter because he has high charisma. <sighs> I, as, as a... Not for the last time this episode. I'm, tr- I'm trying really hard not to diverge on the topic, but I would say someone who plays high charisma characters, it's very frustrating to me when people play high charisma characters just like, I'm going to say anything and then roll high and succeed. Because it's like, no, you have to actually yeah. be charismatic. You can do this by saying, yay, but he's also, he also has like a four wisdom, so of course he says inappropriate buffoonery things, but he just does it with conviction. Mm-hmm. It's anyway. like, if I were dungeon mastering this, I would give some of these encounters disadvantage, but I mean, oh, I'm also, sure. I would also be the one to make your standard, standard, I am a lonely dude, who, socially awkward dude who plays, a, who plays a bard to LARP. My fantasies about sleeping with many women actually flirt with me. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have this one, I have, uh, my DM has this particular thing that I really respect was it, which is that sometimes she will just like not let people do deception rolls because like she will just decide like no sorry that particular lie is just not going to fly with this particular person and like no matter how convincing you are this particular character is just not going to believe this particular thing and try harder 
basically. Try, not just try harder, but like try more specifically. <laughs> Because it's like sometimes That's, yeah. it, it, knowing how to, to be de- like to in order to get to the point of a deception or a charisma check, for example, I think you have to actually try to like understand the character. And if you're just saying things and just spouting obvious lies or something that they won't necessarily believe, then it's like in there it needs to, in order for the a deception check to actually happen, there needs to be a shadow of a doubt that this person could conceivably believe this but yes this is an aside sorry <laughs> yeah this was just i mean it, i feel like it is relevant but we also kind of vow to talk as little about tiberius as we can which is hard because that's true this is probably going does to a thing cut. where he pops in front of a social encounter and it's like i am saying the things we need now and now i'm rolling really high on the, on persuasion which mm-hmm. isn't very satisfactory role playing just saying but you know first episode i suppose <laughs> you say that with, as, as if there's any hope of him getting better. I'm trying to role play. I'm trying to LARP like a version of myself that doesn't know how <laughs> this will happen. It's like this is my first time watching episode one, and not my second time in the past two weeks. <sighs> anyway, so after they talk to Bogus, they, they then buy a, a cask of ale, I think. Yeah, that's somehow. Get him to give up his most fanciest ale. Yeah, for like a, a cup of congealed dragon blood. Delicious. Probably extremely useful. Extremely useful. Uh, they can kind of split off their own, go their own separate ways and sort of do try to, well, under the guise of espionage, I will say. Some of them. Like the twins go off into espionage by posing as tourists. Um, Grog and Scanlan go off to the next brothel. And Tiberius goes off to cast spells at the house of a magically gifted family that's going to, uh, that I think he wants to buy items from. And Percy and Keyleth stay in the pub and write common cards. Yeah, it's very cute. They write common cards. They do. Percy's very good at calligraphy. He is. This is his job now, apparently. Yes. Uh. The brothel part is pretty short, but still kind of uncomfortable, like at some point Sam has like a sex noises and Laura calls it also being uncomfortable. Thank you. Yeah, they also say uh, some uncomfortable terms for sex workers. Uh, they do. They do. Keep in mind that this was 2015 too. Like, yes. I don't... I think that was around the time when internet parents made the term sex worker, of course, at least um, made it known to me, though I'm aware that I'm not a measuring stick. <laughs> That's true. But they yeah. get better about it. They get way better about it. Yes, this is just a moment where I, I thank God that this is this is the um it does not ever become like this again. Not to this extent. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, no, not like this. It is a very uncomfortable part. So after, It is. And then we go to the twins who are pretending to be tourists to check out the Grace by Manor. Yeah, Vex uh tries to pass off as a married couple, but I don't know how. Vex almost made us include incest as one of the trigger warnings. He almost did. <laughs> but Vex very quickly shuts him down with the obvious obsession of their brother and sister, and they look like a brother and sister. <laughs> They're <laughs> identical twins, however genetically impossible that might be. Yes, this is just not going to. Why, why did you. Why is this going to. How is this even going to fly by these people? Vex just be her brother. Mm hmm. Or as Matt says, this is not legal in Crackhammer. <laughs> so they then talk to the guards. Uh, they learn a little bit the car- about the carvers and sort of the uh, the politics of Crackhammer. Uh, Vex flirts with a guard. Oh, she does. Honestly, very smooth. She just flirts with a guard and walks off with him so Vex can stealth back into the area mm-hmm. that the guards didn't really want, want to let them go into. Yep, but she doesn't... She does not defer from that afterwards, just because it doesn't work. I mean, it works fine. It's just not that Vex finds anything out. It's just Vex is busy for the evening. She sure is. Like my Roden girls do, she takes the guard out. Mm-hmm. When they all regroup at the, at the bar and talk about having hickeys, she uh, also has hickeys. Yes, and then there's an awkward silence that Percy eventually breaks. It's cute. <laughs> Meanwhile, 
Tiberius is off casting spells at a house that won't let him enter. Well, not knock. Like, he tries to knock, gets repelled, tries casting spells at the rune that repels him, and then it escalates, and then the people obviously think he's trying to attack a house with magic, which he does for five minutes. And then yes. the guards come because he is attacking a house and has been for five minutes. Yes, and instead of arresting uh... him, he just, he... Is this very uncomfortable when you're aware of some stuff surrounding Orion? He just very suddenly and loudly yells at them and mm. rolls very high on his persuasion roll. Yeah, this is where or I intimidation. S- this is where I sped past this particular scene because I do not like hearing men yell. I particularly do not like hearing this man yell. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Let's see. Is nothing of value is lost. Mis- nothing of value is lost skipping over the scene. Exactly. So they return to the bar to find a, uh, well... Yeah, back to the send away, Trinket. Trinket the Bear, hi. Have you heard of him? He's Trinket the Bear, he's very important. But maybe don't take him into this gated community with you. So she sends him back to the bar, where he is immediately put into a fighting ring. (laughs) Oh, poor Trinket. He's such a good boy. He is, he doesn't deserve this. He doesn't deserve this. He's just a little small bear, and he wants his mom. Yeah, they do some, they do some fancy spell uh, escapades doing this, and manage to turn Trinket into a rat and switch him with a beast-shaped keyless, who then rolls the camp the stream's first natural twenty to um uh, to perform as a dancing bear, and then the party just goes on. Yep, bogus definitely needs therapy. <laughs> Yeah, many people do. Yeah, he's a a grown man crying at the side at the, the sight of a dancing bear because he's just hasn't been outside for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. So the next day or something, time is a little bit loose here. Um, they make their way officially over to the Graceline Manor, but before that. Tiberius has the bright idea to turn himself into a dwarf with a spell. A very and bright idea. Can, yes. Extremely bright idea. He just, because he speaks dwarvish, okay, but he's also just the dwarf that nobody there has ever seen before, mm-hmm. pretending to be from Crackhammer, and the first name he comes up with is Tiberius Crackhammer. John New, New York, as they say. Tiberius yes. Crackhammer. He then, he then changes it to, to, like, Stronghammer, I think, which feels like a racist microaggression. Yes, which, of, of which there which are Which this episode is full of, by the way, Tari the fantasy race. Mm-hmm. There's lots of fantasy racism in this episode. This will be in the, the uh, content warnings because of this. <laughs> it kind oh, of has to be, right? It has to be, It's I weird, so. but it's also it kind weird. of has to be. Kind of has to be. Uh... But yes, so they talk to the gray, the gray spines. It's not a very fun conversation. Scanlan does a. I mean, they talk to the servant who is refusing to let them in because they don't because they don't have an appointment, but also point them towards the mines. Yes, Scanlan goes invisible, I believe, and then uh, wanders in into the house while the other people distract the servant for no reason at all. It does they nothing. Gain nothing from this. Nothing is gained. And he just. Bams out after a few minutes. Mm-hmm. And then they go to the mines. Because this was nothing. This is a nothing burger. Yeah. It's just, you can kind of tell that they have a hard time remembering that they're on official business. They're not doing anything shady. They don't need to lie their way into places. They don't need to deceive people. Yes, they are official people who have every right to be here. So do you, Leo. Can you hear him right now? He's... Yes, he makes noises. He's a rumbly boy. He's a rumbly boy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they go to the mines, they talk to the owner of the mines about Kiwa and... Who he was very put out by. Mm -hmm. They attempt to make a deal, which is very confusing. I'm not quite sure what the deal they're trying to make is exactly. Leave us into the mines and we take care of your problem, which... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Sure. This is like you're offering a service with no, with nothing he has to do except for letting you perform the service. Okay. Yeah. It's like if the if the Pied Piper was like 
I'll let you, you know, I'll get rid of all of your rats for you, but in return, you have to let me get rid of all of your rats. And they're like, I don't know about it. Pretty you. much. And they just keep talking around in circles until the guy gets really, really annoyed. Yes. <laughs> and that's when the bell rings and we find we go straight to our first uh our first fight scene of the stream. Yes, which I actually thought thought I had a moment of like confusion about because I was like, oh yeah, goblins, I remember goblins. I don't remember trolls. When did the trolls come in? And I just watched this episode pretty recently, so I completely forgot about the trolls. And I was like, I thought wasn't there like a Frankenstein Dunaga situation? And then Right at the last moment, Frankenstein Naga, Naga comes in. Yay! Yeah, that's like, the plot has arrived briefly before it gets taken down. Um, what is worth noting is that, uh, I mean, I suppose we're just going to get into that later, but like, the goblins run out and only attack on instinct and not, are not really there to attack. Same for the trolls. Mm -hmm. They are all running from this Frankenstein Naga. Yes. This yeah. encounter has no survivors on the troll or goblin side. Or and some um, some casualties on the dwarf sides as well from our yeah, intrepid adventures. Yeah, because throwing fireballs into a mine shaft is a great idea. Which I mean, like I had, I cringed about not even just because of the casualties, but also because of the natural gases. Yeah, again, open fire and explosions. In a mining area. Yeah, and like... Great. I think Matt describes it as like almost being a strip mine. No, he definitely uses the word strip mine. Yeah, which I don't think is entirely true because he does talk about like a singular mine shaft, which is like not what a strip mine is really. Um, but I'm pretty sure strip mines are like notoriously bad for releasing natural gases into the atmosphere, among other things. Like erosion and shit, but like... Uh, don't I mean, I grew up around coal mines, so I can't really talk about. I have no idea about strip mines. No, um, but you can certainly talk about the flammability. The mine uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, don't blow things up around mines for uh, both historical trauma and also they're quite flamm flammable. There's many flammable things around mines. With, yeah, especially don't throw any fireballs at, at running civilians coming at you. Yes. I think that's a war crime. That is a war crime, I believe. Anyway, and that's uh, basically where we wrap the episode. Is uh, we take out the they take out the, the naga and we finish up there with uh, the hint of the ark to come as they are to enter the underdark after some some preparation, if I recall correctly. But yes, we end on defeating the naga. We sure do. Uh, Scanlan we actually gets sure the, do. the "How do you want to do this?" I remember the first "How do you want to do this?" of this stream, and also apparently. Sam's own first how do you want to do this because <laughs> Bart back when they played Pathfinder apparently did nothing. Yes. I will say that I've also never, as, having played a Bart, I've never gotten a how do you want to do this. I'm so sorry for you. I got a mutual how do you want to do this once, but that was fun. Like with other people. I think I've gotten yeah. a few how do you want to do this with my Bart. Yeah. It Which by the way, it. mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing that Critical Role has managed to make this just an established term. We don't play in the same, we don't play in the same, uh, in the same group. No, we don't. Or same language or same medium. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the very, but, like, the, the idea of, like, a coup d'etat kind of, uh, final blow is, I think, very much introduced, not necessarily introduced, I'm sure it existed before Critical Role, but it was, like, Codified by Critical um, Role, I think. You might be you might be confusing some terminology there because like coup d'etat mechanics were like I think a thing oh. in several D and D games and stuff or D and D or D and D inspired games. Mm -hmm. um, what you mean is just the act of letting a player narrate their killing blow. Yes, yes. Like I'm sorry, this of... is me being a smart ass, but like. No, no, it's important to clarify the difference because I I do want to specify that this is exactly what you're describing. It's not just necessarily. Having the killing blow, which I think is a thing that existed far before then, but the idea of allowing the player to describe, sort of take a little bit of the initiative and describe how they want yeah. to do the killing blow. I think that's something that very much was codified by Critical Role. Yeah, yeah. Like, to the extent that my own DM, who 
hasn't watched a single episode of Critical Role, even though his entire party has. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that's why most of us are there. Anyways, he has started doing this, not with the same term because we play in German, just because this is... I'm pretty sure this is just a done thing by now. Yeah, it's just a thing that many people do, and, and not everybody calls it how do you want to do this. There are many other ways to describe it, but like the idea has persisted. It has. Critical Role has, uh, has sort of become entrenched into uh, D&D, especially 5e. I think for many reasons, especially because like it kind of came out at the same time as 5e. And actually involved them playing 5e, at least sometimes. Like, if you are someone who is very much into the crunchy rule aspect of D&D, we encourage you not to pay close attention to the fight scenes, especially not during the early episodes, because... <laughs> What even are rules? Yeah, and I think this is actually something that I really enjoy about Critical Role Campaign 1, especially compared to Campaign 2, which is that, like, uh, they're also, in a way, new to the game. Like, yes, they have started, this is a, an ongoing campaign that they were playing for years before they started recording it, but this is, they played Pathfinder before this, so in a way they are also new to Critical, like, sorry, not they're not new to Critical Role, but they are new to D&D. They are! D &D. They've just invented this. They are very new to Critical Role. <laughs> they're very new to Critical Role, and, and they're very new to D&D. &D. Like, they're still learning the rules. Fight is very different from the other editions. And, yeah. Yeah, it, it just seems like also they're... there's just, there's a bunch of, like, house rules Matt has. Some of them he has abandoned for Campaign 2. Also, they've just become so much more fluid with the combat in Campaign 2. It's amazing. Um, yes. I mean, they're going to become more fluid in later fights. This is just... Yeah. Um, but also, just instances where I was like, okay, yeah, Scanlan can just give five inspirations in this combat round. That's fine, I guess. He's yeah. Sure, that's not a I reaction. Uh, it's a bonus action, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a bonus action. I remember. Yeah, but you only get one of those. You only get one bonus action on your turn. Yes, technically. Also, I didn't keep track, I didn't quite remember, it might just be that it was a low-level spell, but at one point, uh, Tiberius uses sorcery points to cast one big spell and then another little spell, and Matt has said later on that up to level 2 spells can be cast as a bonus action by that's doing this. also a house rule. Wait, no, that's not the, that's not, that's not the house rule part, that the sorcery points make it so that you can cast something as a bonus action that should be an action, I think. Um, but what is house rule is that you're allowed to spend more than one spell slot during a turn. Yes. At least if the second one is like level up to level two or something, I think. Yeah, that's... Um, but if you are not aware of these house rules, it's like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on. It's not my favorite fight, to be honest with you. No, but it's also not the worst fight, and it is pretty quick. It's about half an hour. Yeah, I did like that um, the twins had, like, coordinated attacks. They Just, did. I roll off her back. Yeah, we rehearsed this. <laughs> they sure did. And this is not the last time we'll nice. see them do this. Uh-huh. Yeah, also, like, the combat optics are way better than I imagined, than I remembered them being. They already have a top-down camera, and the, and the map that was drawn for this was kind of pretty. It the, was. the minis are unpainted and all kind of look the same from the top-down camera. Yeah, I will say that I'm surprised by how much of things, like, as much as we can focus on things that weren't ironed out, there are some things that are pretty ironed out from this point on. Yeah. Yeah, the, world yeah, like the quality is... is going to increase, but it's not going to be like the show changed a lot technically, but the these are very much the bare bones of it, but the pretty good bone structure. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that completely, like, that analogy of, like, it, this is bare bones, but these are the bones of which that will, that will become the show, like, They're good no, bones, Brent. They're good bones, Brent. <laughs> yeah, it's, and also changes are, are very much, like, boiling the frog, like, they are very incremental. Uh, the audio improves, but it doesn't, there's no, I actually got into this discussion with someone who asked about, like, where should I start with Critical Role Campaign 1? When does the audio get good? And we couldn't really pinpoint a time where the uh, the audio just got better. Like, it felt like the audio just sort of gradually becomes better as the show goes on. 
Maybe we can pinpoint the point where the audio gets better when we keep doing this podcast. <laughs> but I too don't really remember. I remember other episodes I suggest people start with, but I don't think that's based on audio quality. Yes, in our own subjective scale, I'll say that this episode is not very friendly to new listeners. Uh, yeah, like, I remember being very frustrated with it when I tried to get into the show. Like, I think I fell asleep out of frustration from being overwhelmed with information and not really caring about what was going on by the time they got to the dancing bear act. Yes. I mean, I also will say that I think that, like, there are some things that will attract you. I think we've gotten to the to the discussion points of this, but there are some things that... Oh, we are definitely at the discussion but. Um, it's fine, we have been discussing naturally the entire time, almost like this actually works. Almost like this actually works. But yeah, I think that there's a lot of things here that, um, despite the fact that this episode doesn't really do a very good job of introducing the show, uh, there are some things that I can remember drawing me in, despite myself and making me at least want to watch episode two. Um, uh, I remember the comment card specifically being something that the really like made me endeared to Percy in particular, despite the fact that Percy for the the first arc kind of remains in the background. He does do some fancy talk in this episode. I was that that got to me too. Like when he introduces himself to official people, he is on. He is He's dropping on. his name and um doing the fancy words at the people. Yeah, Percy Tirolo, for those of you who who have never heard him speak, Code Switch is like a motherfucker. Oh yeah. He loves to good switch. So he will be talking... So does Vex, actually. So does Vex. It's another thing. I actually have this in my notes. I have them written as... Uh, Percy and Vex are team parents. I have shipper glasses. <laughs> that is in my notes. Because of how they talked to the mine mine owner. Or the mine... Yes, the mine owner. Uh, Vex is just in full-on party leader mode, which she, is a thing she does at all times. We just don't, like, you don't notice it while watching it because it happens so naturally. Yeah. She just kind of takes naturally. charge in every social encounter. She really does. And also, we get uh, a little bit of a moment where, you know, of course, Percy is, is being his full royal self, but they, they both also try to assist on, like, a, a stealth role at some point to, like, distract, I think, while someone get, tries to steal uh, ale. Um... And yeah, I think yeah, because they promised they promised the guards to get them some of the fancy ale that they get that they gave the Graceline dude. Mm-hmm. So at some point, Vex tries to do like a pratfall and fails, and also Percy tries to help at the same time, and they're just both trying to and failing to distract. And I thought it was very cute. They both have like a very like bubbling parent energy. They do, even though we're not actually we're not. And this isn't even officially in shipper in shipper territory. No, yet. not so even. Few off. No, it's just the, it's just me appreciating how well they work together. Yes, they do, they do. We can also appreciate that Vex, uh, before the stream got to her, kind of slept around a bit apparently. Oh yeah, she Good just she took that guard out. She sure did. And so yeah. much so that he can't work the next day. Must have been a long and good night. <laughs> that must have been a very. She may she may have still left him tied up. We don't know. He might be still tied up somewhere. He's a... It's he's a by rodent thing. It's a by rodent thing. But yeah, I think what it is... Do we have to check this with EXU spoilers now? <laughs> no. I think that... <laughs> I think that Vex just gives <laughs> off that energy. <laughs> she does! That's why it fits so well that you guys wrote poetry about it. Yes, yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, also, while we're at the... the um, and mm-hmm. the situation where they tried to steal fancy ale from the guy they've given it to as a present. Uh-huh. Did you notice that Vex actually promised the guard some of his fancy ale, swearing on his father's good name? <laughs> I didn't notice that. I did. It's an amazing line. I love it. <laughs> Vax and the guard swearing by his good name. His, his father's, father's good, good name. name. Yes. It was very fun. Ah. Uh... Those are some good words. Those are some good words. And we do know that the party knows who the, who the, the twins' dad is, because they've met him before. They have. It's in the back, It's in the narration from the, from the story of, of Vox Machina that we've referred to before. It is. 
they met the dad and it was apparently dramatic and they met their half sister and it was dramatic well probably more cute but yeah yes also in terms of establishing world building in the first episode they mention Komorda right here up in the first episode of Crime Pain 1 uh, and Komorda is for those of you who are Campaign 2 listeners uh, Komorda is where Beauregard is from which Ball did have to remind me of and also I didn't catch that line uh, it's um, it's where they talk to Balgus and he talks about making like fancy wine out of blood thistle that he got from do 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 Komorda and that pretty much do 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 to, to do so yeah the the, the establishing of Komorda is like a it's like a, a a wine district how would i say that it's like a it's like the a wine napa area? valley the, the napa valley of wild mount the what the napa valley is that an american thing yes it's where wine comes from in california okay but yeah it's a it's established pretty early on in, in episode 1 and it won't come back until you know, campaign too, but it is incredible how like cohesive the world building is from the very first episode. We or just the name Matt wrote down at some point and then was like, Oh, that sounds like a cool name, I'm going to incorporate this into my next not next setting, but like into the grander setting. This might, that might be possible. But we can't really know for sure. Uh, unless he tells us personally, which I mean he's free to do. Yes. <laughs> and we'll be listening to this podcast and uh, Please no. Yeah, we should also talk about like some of the things that made us uncomfortable in this particular episode. Can we like wait for this and just talk about the bar? Yeah, let's talk about the bar. I really want to talk about the gay bar vibes. Talk like, about the gay bar we, vibes. As we already alluded to, like Brock walks in, and when he's given the side eye, he's like, "I'm, I'm a, I'm a badass," and everyone is like, "Yeah, buy him a drink." And then at another point, he takes off his, well, harness. He doesn't really wear a shirt to show off his scars. And then all these these dwarves come up and also take off their shirts to show off their scars. And it's just, okay, this is a bar. It is also sure noted is. that all the barmaids... Oh, God. Yeah. Like, the bar is run by a female dwarf. And all the barmaids are male. They call them barmaiders. Yep. So, like... Honestly, maybe our read of this as a gay bar wasn't that far off. No, I stand by this read. I think it's, it's a, a very bear good bar. Read. It's a gay dwarf bar. <laughs> yes. And then there's the owner of the bar, whose name has thrown me for a loop, because the first time Matt says it, with a heavy Scottish accent, it's like, Ader or something, or Adir? And mm-hmm. I was like, wait a minute. If you spell this with A-E-D-Y-R... That's a continent and an empire in Pillars of Eternity 1. And if it's you, if you spell it E-D-E-R, that's a dare. That's one of your 2.5 characters, Matt. Matt, what are you doing? <laughs> this game even out yet? Which is why I knew for, by heart when the episode was first aired on the 12th of March, 2015. Because I looked up when Pillars of Eternity came out, and it was on March 26th of the same year. So, wow. like, this was like stealth marketing almost. It's very fun how Critical Role can, like, encompasses the entirety of uh, Pillars of Eternity up until this point, huh? Huh. It kind of does. They even use the soundtrack later on. Yes. And also, like, the owner of the bar isn't actually called Ader Ederhedede. She's called Adra, which Adra. is a magical stone substance growing out of the ground in Pillars of Eternity. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe um, I had it on the brain, or maybe Matt also had it on the brain. Who knows? Yes. It's also worth noting that the Scot that the uh, Scottish woman accent he has going on, the voice he has going on for Adra, it's mm-hmm. very close to the alter ego of his other character in that game. Oh, oh, I know that one because it's the, the the Scottish accent kind of voice, right? Yeah, it's a, it's the Scottish woman who just occasionally takes over and insults people. Yes, this is also a very good introduction to uh, Matt doing female voices, especially for uh, like barkeep or shopkeep NPCs. It's very fun. He does these occasion, and they're always such fun voices. I really respect how like yes. Matt does female voices in particular because they do sound very like distinct. But he never really like, does like a, a high pitched kind of. He doesn't do, do your abridged series standard woman's voice, woman's voice! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he never does. 
like that. He he really like tries to impart a lot of character into these. Uh, like it is very much you're able to kind of tell when he's doing a, a female character, but he from the very first campaign just sort of has like that the very natural way of approaching his characters. It doesn't feel like how normal male DMs do them. Or as I mentioned before, a bridge series. Or a bridge series. <laughs> Tended to do with the fact that they were that they had an all male cast, or, or a being, one male I've, cast. I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks lately, and I will say that even professional voice actors who read audiobooks tend to do those. Oh dear. Woman, I am a woman. This is a woman's voice. <laughs> sort of Does this work when we do this because we have women's voices? I, do we have women's voices? I think so. <laughs> it's hard to tell. But yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they get extremely ripped off by Audra, by the way, because she way overcharges for those rooms. She definitely overcharges them for these rooms. Like, I did uh, the math. I did the math that Laura couldn't because she didn't have a calculator, which also mm-hmm. seemed like her just being like, oh, I don't want to haggle right now and drive down the energy of the stream because we're doing this for an audience. But that might just be in my head. And just to put like the last tidbit on top of the gay bar thing, when mm-hmm. Adra is asked about Kima, she gets very close to describing just how hot Kima was. <laughs> That's true. I think that she explains in great detail how much she was into Kima's attitude. She sure does. I wonder a lot about like how how do halflings look to dwarves, but that's okay. Uh, that's not important right now. The important thing is that Matt cannot create a female character without making her at least bisexual, if not a f- an outright lesbian. <laughs> that might very well be. Well, hmm, we'll see. We'll keep track of that. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's. Re- I don't think he's performed a single straight woman role <laughs> as an NPC. Counterpoint. Uh-huh. That might just be our bias. Is it though? Is it though? We might just be refusing to acknowledge that some of these women might. Some of these women, yes, my English is very good, you guys. Uh, some of these women might be straight. I don't know. I mean, like. Spoilers for campaign one, but Cassandra. Look, I'm not arguing with you that I, that I. I do think Cassandra is not straight. I would also agree that I think that ni- none of his iconic female villains are straight. That's true. But. That might just be our bias and our read on these things. Well, the author is dead. <laughs> and Is he? <laughs> well, no, but we're not on Twitter. So, the author Aren't is on we? Twitter. The author is on we Twitter. We are on Twitter. You can follow us on Twitter. <laughs> we're not, we don't believe personally in our own distinct roles and asking the author for confirmation of things. We just interpret and I choose to interpret all of Matt's characters as being uh, Wooloos. Oh, wo- WLWs. Wooloos! Wooloos, yes. Woo. I think it's just the, it's a better reading. W-dubs. W-dubs. Where's the L in that one? The, all of Matt's characters are <laughs> World Wide Webs. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to talk about guns. They're friends of Mara. They're friends of Mara? <laughs> I'm going to talk about guns now. I want to talk about guns. I know it's not related to the pub. We were at the pub. You talk about guns, sweetie. I want to talk about guns. So I really like the sort of progression that we get from Percy's guns in particular, because I think they're very, like, they have, like, a weird amount of personality, despite them being some of the weapons that are non-living in a, sh- in a-, a show with living weapons. You can totally make an argument for them to be kind of living. Well, do you... I mean, I mean there's something living in them. They sure... Are, they're, they're like hermit crab shells. That works. Yeah, that, that works. works. very well. Yes. But I, I still... Ha-ha, I think Orthic that, like... Ne- Orthic never got big enough to fit into the biggest gun. Ha-ha. Ha-ha. No, uh-huh. but the, I also think that it's very telling that, like, the biggest gun is... So this episode is actually also the first episode where Percy uh, debuts his new gun... Which is that? I mean, news. of course, it's the first first episode, but he. This is also a freshly newly built gun from the half year break they took between. 
Yeah, he spent the last six Games months making before. bad news, and bad news is his absolutely gigantic. I think I think maybe eight foot long gun. I don't do numbers very well. Probably it is big. Like it's also foldable. Yes, and he has to like like I think it really is like kind of cumbersome to shoot. It does not have like the the sh- the sort of automatic shooting power that the revolvers have. He does describe crouching down to use it, and he does do some hand movements to use it again. Yeah, uh, it's a big boy. Bad news is a big boy. Bad news is also a very good girl. <laughs> that is how I think of her in my mind. Is bad news is a very good girl because she's like the Percy's <laughs> Percy's good mind place gun. Because I think it like, is Percy's least problematic gun. Yeah, exactly. It's a gun that was like never really contains a demon. It's a gun that he made out and like after finding a party and having friends. It's his six months in a good place gun. Uh, and yeah, he did that to, without demonic interference. Without demonic interference, without having to like make it out of revenge. Like it's not a revenge gun. It is a protect my friends gun. Right. That's yeah. why this gun never has to be exercised. Yes. Which is why I, I still to this day am very fond of bad news. I think that bad news is just like a, a very controlled gun, I will say. It is also the last gun Percy builds for himself. That's true. And the first gun that he did use on the show. Uh, yep. The rest he kind of just scavenges. Like a video game character. I mean, apparently the only reason... um. Spoilers, I guess. Ripley shows up is to drop loot for Percy to upgrade his weapon. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we can call her, yes. I wonder what kind of loot Percy drops. No, you don't. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I'm very fond of that news. I think it's also, a didn't you watch gun. the... Um, didn't you watch the Battle Royale where he might have dropped loot? I did watch the Battle Royale where he might have dropped loot. I bet I, I'm not particularly compelled by the Battle Royales. N- neither am I, but did he drop loot there? None that I can remember. Okay, then. I mean, to be fair, since Beth wasn't in the game, who would have who would have used the guns anyway? That's a good point. I don't think many members of Fox Machina know how to use guns. I mean, yeah, Scanlan would, but I hear he was busy. <laughs> yes. Um... Hmm. What else do I want to talk about in terms of guns? I don't have very much. I just wanted to talk about how I'm very fond of Van Dues as a gun because it is like the least demonically aligned. Uh, what did you want to talk about? Um. Let me think about. I have all of these wonderful, wonderful notes available to you if you follow us on Patreon. Support us on Patreon. I mean, um. Follow the patriarch. Don't follow the patriarch. Fuck the patriarch. Hey God, I have some news. I have I have some things here. I have some notes too here as well. Uh, I have. Uh, I remember skin. Are we talking song. about things that make us uncomfortable? What? Do you want to talk about things that make us uncomfortable, such as patriarchs? No, you first. <laughs> uh, I mean, like other than the fantasy dwarf racism, racism which is a thing in this. Um, I was I mean, mostly made yeah. uncomfortable by the brothel scene. Okay, we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. just it's like the brothel scene explains why a certain audience us- usually found more towards the Reddit and 4chan spaces than we are felt very invited by this show. <laughs> yes, and there are actual literal slurs against sex workers in this episode. It's not good. Though to get getting them recognized as slurs was again very much in like a beginning Infancy, step. Yes, we're not even quite there yet today. Yeah, but it's just, it's a very like I will say that the actual brothel scenes don't bother me as much. Like I'm not as bothered by like I don't like the sort of scandal of making sex noises part. But like, I thank you, Laura. Hmm. Thank you, Laura, for shutting that down. Thank you, Laura, for shutting that down. But like in terms of like how the sex workers actually are treated, they do seem to be characters. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like not the worst. It's not the best sex workers on the show. Not um, by far, not by long shot. By characterization, I mean not by performance. I'm not going to judge anything in regards to that. 
Oh, no, 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 no. But in terms of just, like, the depiction of the actual sex workers themselves, I'm not as insulted by, but it's just... It's... Yeah, yeah, I don't consider the presence of sex workers, sex worker brothels to be inherently offensive Yeah, it's just the anything. treatment of them specifically in this episode. Yes. very uncomfortable. It's the same way I was sort of, like, it is a bit of an eye roll moment every time, but I was sort of okay with the presence of brothels in Dragon Age 1 and 2. Two more than one, <laughs> because two also had more plot happening. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, 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 there's not much to say about it. It's just bad. It's a bad scene. It's not good. I'm glad that you don't do this again. It is. They do, like, allusions to this, but the that, like, it's always a joke at the expense of Grog, actually. Only Grog. Yeah, like, at some point, I think uh, Pike says that she goes to brothels, and, like, Yes! There's no, like, bait and switch about it. Like, I've seen people interpret it as a bait and switch, like, oh, she goes there for medical checkups. Like, no, she doesn't say that. No. She just says that she goes and frequents sex workers at times when she's alone. Yep, because she has nothing else to do. It doesn't sound like she's working there, does it? No, it doesn't. It just sounds like she uh, is a grown woman with I... needs and, and yeah, occasionally hires people to fulfill those needs. Yeah. Like, the same way in which we don't think that Vex just spent the evenings playing chess and drinking tea with that guard. <laughs> she definitely did not. Are those the same people who were like, uh, oh, Bo and Riani just made out? And then Marisha went on the show and was like, why would I just make out? <laughs> <laughs> why would she ever just make out? Yeah, no, so, all yeah. of these women are very sexually active on this show. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the characters. I am, I am, I think I'm more comfortable in... in, in further depictions of sex work in this campaign and future campaigns. I'm not mm -hmm. always comfortable with it, but in this particular case it is not the worst one I've seen, but definitely not the best by far. Yep. Alright. Like, it is uncomfortable, and, it, and it's going to be more uncomfortable for, other, for people that are not us, and we acknowledge that. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, I also uh... have... Hmm? Just some small notes that I have. Uh, Scampin's Sham. This is going to be the most pedantic I'm going to be. He always minds drumming it. <laughs> or talks while playing it. That's not what mm -hmm. a sham is. Do tell us what a sham is, darling. A sham is like an oboe. Okay. It's a wind instrument. You blow into it. You can't but sing then what while playing a sham. From, from, I know what differentiates it from his flute, but like, yeah... It's like a, a conical, it's like, you know those, like, um... It's like a real big recorder. Yeah, like a real big recorder that has a kind of like a trumpet end. You know those? It's a recorder trumpet love child. Yes, exactly. But my main <laughs> point of that is that I don't think Seattle ever decides what the sham is, and it's just, depending on the moment, he'll just be like, it's, a, it's a, basically a guitar, or it's basically a flute, or it's basically like a... I think he also regards it as like a wind, like a, a bagpipe, and it's like it's not any of those things. It's a, <laughs> he in it's, this episode he pulled out like a phone and plays like some electronic ish sounding piano ish sounding stuff to represent the sham sounds. Yes, that's not what Which... a sham is. <laughs> a sham is like yeah. an actual instrument. I know this is it so exists. pedantic, but not on like, the not on the table to roll for for shits and giggles. It exists. It exists. It's a real thing. Just Google it, please. <laughs> I know this makes me sound like the wor like the worst kind of fuddy duddy, but just like Google it once. <laughs> like the worst kind of what, please? Fuddy duddy. Like, I'm, like a, a a spoil sport. I'm ruining the fun. Yes, but also. I am very sure we are going to have many, many pedantic moments. <laughs> That's true. That is basically what we're here for. It is in my Twitter bio. It is basically my chosen career. That's true. <laughs> God, you're good at it, though. Am I? Am I really? Anyway, <sighs> anyway. I, am, I am looking at notes. Um, oh, there was also another very uncomfortable conversation they have with... Um, with Mr. Grayspine Nustop, I think, um, mm -hmm. about Kima, where he was asked to, what did she look like, small and angry, and then 
And Tiberius says, so not a look, so not, not a looker. And like, Ugh. Ugh. We also get the seeds of, of Grog's deeply uncomfortable attraction to Kima. Oh, buddy. I mean, oh, Grog. It's bash bro I don't. It, it, yeah, he. he, he this is not he, the most uncomfortable attraction to, not to a female character we're going to be seeing on this show. No, but he doesn't have some uncomfortable things that, in retrospect, have made. Well, not even in retrospect. While I was watching Campaign One in the first time back in 2015, I was like, this is uncomfortable and this is making me uncomfortable. Uh, but that's you not watched this in 2015? Episode. Hmm? No, I watched this in 2015? No, thank you for correcting me. This was one of a You are retconning our session zero, which you totally should watch, by the way, guys. But no, I started watching in, in 2016, you're right. Uh, yeah, no, this was, even back then, made me uncomfortable uh, with just some of the, yeah, the stuff I mean, that's done to Gima, but that all that comes later. I basically just skimmed the first few episodes because I wanted to get to the good parts, and the good parts were episode 69 onwards. So, um, they weren't actually the show gets good before, but yeah, as far as I knew at the time. Yes. Yes. No, yeah, I understand. Yes. So, yes. since uh, we have apparently to... exhausted our notes. Um, I have here in my own notes the Carver Industrial Complex, <laughs> <laughs> which I quite found very fun. Okay. What else do I have in my notes? I'm just going through because I write very fun notes. I wrote, I wrote they have ass minds. It was a discussion that yeah. they had was about... Just as mines, as mines, whatever. The Scottish is strong. The Dwarvish is strong. It is very strong. I have a terrible good college d- dwarf accident, which sounds like a good band name. <laughs> I also have Dwarf in Alaska, which I've written sounds like a delicious dessert. Huh. Yeah, that was in regards to... That's kind of interesting world building of, like, dwarves don't really have, I mean, they like, live underground, so they like don't a... really have, like, a day-night cycle, but they... Sort of yeah. try to keep track with the outside world just for like trade reasons, but other than that, they just sleep when they need to. Which sounds so nice. Eat when you want to, sleep when you want to, wake up and do some work when you I want to. I don't think that's actually how it works, but yeah, sure. In theory, it sounds great. I'm sure that they have like set hours to work, but like the idea of just like having like whatever sleep the whenever. The sky does not command you, there is no sky. Go the fuck to bed whenever you want. Exactly. I think it's very fun. As someone who takes a lot of naps, I think it's very fun. <laughs> All right. So, kind of leading over into this uncomfortable things we have talked about is like you can you get especially during these early episodes you get very strong hints of how this used to be a very different game they played. Yeah. It's a very different vibe. One thing we observed while watching was that. This entire thing where everyone goes to their own thing and let's say Vex goes haggling for an hour or Tiberius casts magic at a place for an hour is like just... Or Mm -hmm. Grog and Scanlan go to a brothel and it's described in great detail. It's a lot easier to do and handle when everyone else can just like leave the table, get a snack, take a bathroom break, read a book, co-mingle in the living room and talk about unrelated things while this is going on. Which is not something that is easily done while streaming. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's it's something that I think would have been a lot easier in a home game, especially since they talk about having like six hour plus home games where they would play like once or twice a month and then just for a very, very long time, usually over brunch. Yeah, just the entire day going from brunch to still brunch, but now it's dinner time. Yeah, exactly. I think that, that seems to, to actually be... actually coming home at 3 a.m. after Pike died. Yeah, I wonder where that game started. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that like it, it kind of talks about a more classical D&D setting thing, which I've never actually played because all of my D&D games have been either on a college campus or online. Uh, I have I have had games start in, at noon that last until midnight, and you end up ordering pizza halfway through. I did that a few times. It was great. And then all my lovely roommates who were playing in my campaign were done with their studies and moved away. Ah. Assholes. Assholes. How oh, dare they? But yeah, I, I think there's also some other things about that, that hint about the campaign having been very differently when it was a home game, such as uh, the troll incident when they talk about uh, 
I, yeah. I, yeah, we probably put up a trigger warning about that. Yeah, we did. I can't imagine we didn't, but at some point, I think Tiberius transformed himself into a female troll in order to tempt a... To in Matt's word, Bugs Bunny, some male trolls? Yes. Who then, um, almost raped him? Yeah. But were prevented from that because I think they just... In this episode, they only mentioned Vex, but I think it was Vex and Percy who were just kept taking shots at the troll dick, presumably erect, that was then shut off and kept in the back of holding for a while. Until it turned into slime. Into a slaw, actually, right? I believe so. Uh, but yeah, I think that that also points to, like, this would never happen in a character whole campaign now. <laughs> never ever happen. It wouldn't. It doesn't play good to an audience, but it appears to have been... Like, it plays better to you and your friends at a table if you're all, like... If the tone is, you know, there. Yeah, it just, it hints to a... And I mean, like, I'm not gonna hold them accountable and say, like, this is specifically problematic, because I think it's, like, a... It was something that they had done in the privacy of their own home. Yes. And, like, people could just do and whatever they want. And very wisely chose to not broadcast. Exactly. I think that, like, things that people choose to play in their own games are... Their own games, and they're not about being criticized, but they are not up for the same critique that we offer a critical role being a, yeah. a media property. If it's something that happens at your own table, and everyone at your table is fine with it, okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that like you can criticize things that happen in home games, but it is very different to criticize something that happens in a home game versus criticizing like something that is legitimately a program that is, in theory, making money. And like broadcast at a sizable audience, not that sizable yet, but sizable. Sizable enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Hmm. Is this a very good place to start watching Critical Role? Though it is the beginning. It is. Definitely. It is the beginning, uh, and I do think that it establishes some kind of fun early relationships within the party. We get to see a little bit of the. the- yeah, the twin yeah, I was actually surprised by seeing how many characters just got their moments sometimes. Like, every character got, like, a character moment in this. Mm-hmm. We got a good vaccine, we got some... Many of them, actually. Many good vaccines. We got a little bit of a Percy and Keyleth scene, we got to see P- Keyleth do the dancing bear thing. Got we the... saw Grok getting hit on a, a, in a gay bar without noticing, which, yes. Which is very much in character for Grog. This will not be the last time that we characterize this as having happened. Uh, <laughs> we see uh, a little bit of Scanlan getting the how do you want to do this, and of course being Scanlan. We even get a couple of Scanlan songs. There's not much singing in this episode. There's some singing, singing, but not much of it. Not much of it, but we do get a little bit of a little taste of it. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, I think that like this is very much like a character for a good place. I still wouldn't recommend this as a good place to, to start out. We is... also get Fun Vax, which isn't a good introduction to the campaign because that's not going to last, but yeah. Fun Vax is actually a lot of fun. I had the same reaction. I will. I had like the same moment. Life of the party Vax. He looks so happy. Like, wow, I forgot how like early campaign Vax was so much fun. And the twinsy moments don't make me angry. I don't, and he's like so. F- like Liam is genuinely a very funny role player. Like he's genuinely a very funny guy when he wants to be. When he wants to be, yeah. and uh, that that is what part part of what makes me so disappointed with like late campaign facts and Caleb. <laughs> Just Caleb. Just Caleb as a whole is like he really is so very charming when he wants to be, and he just apparently just chooses time again to not be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apparently it's considered charming by very many people. Not us, though. Not us. Not us. And we are a very, very selective and um, informed audience. Speaking of <laughs> a being very good and selective and unbiased audience, shall we talk about our completely unbiased, completely scientific scale? <laughs> we didn't actually offer up any other places to start the campaign, though. Oh, sorry. Yes, I don't want to talk about it. I forgot that. I apologize. We will hold I mean, admittedly, this was, this was an amazing segue, and we, it, it, it feels horrible to waste it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm willing to say a couple places. I would say, honestly, start at the Trial of the Take. Yeah, I think the Trial of the Take is a good long... I mean, 
The first two Trial of the Take episodes are very good long form introductions to the characters. Yeah. The second two are not. Yeah, you don't the need to watch them. The second two are horrible and you shouldn't watch them. Yeah, but I, I genuinely th- I think most people say to start at um, the Briarwoods arc and I don't disagree. I just think that it's like they're, they go immediately into the plot and if you want more of a character introduction, the first two Trial of the Take episodes are just yeah. kind of very fun. Yeah, everyone has, like, moments in the Briarwoods arc, but the character arcs are just, like, like this is a Percy arc. Yes. It's not a party arc. Yeah. And also, it's very dark and, and very heavy. So if you don't want to just immediately jump into the dark and heavy and want to actually know the characters a little bit before you get into their arcs, I think that the Trial of the Hick is my personal recommendation. Uh, do you have a, an episode that you, you recommend as an introduction? I mean, I think I don't really... I remember it too vaguely, but... I think also just the first one out of the of the story arc, like episode fourteen or so, mm-hmm. the one the one that's called shopping and shipping, could serve as a pretty that's good the one where they meet Gilmore. Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. They don't meet Gilmore. They just re meet him. They re meet Gilmore. Absolutely, meet Gilmore, please. Gilmore is so fun. Okay, yeah, but other than that, I'm kind of out of options because. When I start a rewatch, I tend to either start with episode 28, but that's not a good starting point story-wise. It's just, it kind of is when the story gets good, but there were good moments before that. Yes. I, I also definitely recommend if you want to start in a later episode, and then if you can stomach it, go back and watch the, the Underdark. Still actually do watch it. Just watch it later after you're more attached to the characters, because there are some really fun points in the, the Underdark yeah, I've, it's just, it's kind of sad how little this arc plays into the larger narrative. Yeah, the main thing is the introduction of Kima. Yes, which will... that is relevant later, but only because the part it makes it relevant. And it's kind of the only thing they really wrestle out of this arc that matters later on. Yes. Yeah, I think that it's, just, it's, it's they're, they're fun episodes. They're not quite plot important, but they are just sort of tutorials. Yeah, tutorials with bad audio quality sometimes. <laughs> But yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend okay. episode one as the first episode to watch. You can if you want to. It's not the worst place to start. They're definitely the worst place to start. Don't start at episode 100. <laughs> Don't start at episode 100. Don't start at episode 88. Definitely. Oh, no, no, don't start there. Though you can make an argument for starting at 86, but it's a bad argument. Whatever you do, don't start at episode 27. Don't. Don't even watch for episode 27. We are watching episode 27, so you don't have to. <laughs> okay. We're combining it with episode 26. It is already a battle plan. All right. I think now we can move on to the scale, unless you, you have something else to say. Yeah, of course. We can move on to a perfectly scientific, amazing, objective, pervan scale. A joke that will make sense in 44 episodes. It'll come up. It'll come up, and when it'll come up, it'll be worthwhile. But that's going to be in a good few months from now. It's so worthwhile, you guys. So so worthwhile. Uh, so let us go over the Pervon scale. As we've got over at episode zero, the letters in Pervon stand for uh, P, for pizzazz. Which is about basically the entire presentation of the show, the interface, the maps, the maybe special event dresses of the cast or something. And I gotta say, while, like, we will be, you will be criticizing the presence of the Twitch chat on screen soon. In this episode, it wasn't that distracting. No, it wasn't Very slow bad. going, and not a, to- not, not a toxic cesspit yet. Yes, and they haven't introduced the uh, camera during the, the break, so I have to actually give them, like, I can't subtract points for the break, because we don't watch them do stuff in a yeah. creepy... Uh, no, and way. we also don't have to watch any any Geek and Sundry ads. Which are, you know, at this point... An experience. An experience that brought us closer together as a fandom, and you guys who've only been here for Campaign 2 don't know. You don't know. You have it suffered. You have, it's just... No, you, you have always had the opportunity to just skip through these people yelling at you about International Tabletop Day. Ugh. <laughs> uh. So what do we want to rate for pizzazz on this episode? I don't want to. I don't want to like. I mean, there are two times when the audio gets really bad, but I feel I kind of feel bad 
taking off points yeah, here. Yeah, I would honestly give it like a maybe. It's just a little bit. This is very subjective, but I would actually want to give him a one just for trying. Like having the first episode for anything, especially a live stream, like something you do live, is so very scary. It is so scary. <laughs> Like, yes, this is a very patchy start, but considering how live streams tend to collapse, they haven't had any, like, they had some audio bugs, but they didn't have, like, a live stream crash, which is very impressive. They had audio bugs, though. They had two audio bugs. They could have two audio bugs, but I am actually, like, willing for just this once and never again give them points for attempting. So do you want to give them one point? Because I was like at a very neutral zero point. Yes. That is the scientific thing of our scale. We get we give negative points. The range is negative five to five. Well, so a zero is the median score. Yes. I would say that it's like we're at a zero for a medium score. And then we subtract like two points for the two bugs, let's say. And then we add some points for trying. Trying. Which means they are... At like a, either a zero or a one. Or half a point. Half a point. We will give them 0.5 for pizzazz. Half credit for trying. Half credit for trying. We will let you retake the test. Half a point, which we will then immediately take away because you is for uncomfortableness. Oh god. Oh god. Which we had a lot of. We did. I... I, I mean, like, I know we are not supposed to really talk about Tiberius too much, but the man yellingness of Tiberius, just to... Ugh. Yeah, that, that's just, that's, like, transcendentally uncomfortable. It really is. It just makes you, like, viscerally, like, I don't want to be in this room anymore. <laughs> I want to leave. I want to go away. I mean, even in character, like, just the skeevy asking about if Kima is a looker or not. Or the recounting of the troll dick story. Yeah, and just, we've talked about the brothel scene at length. There's just a bunch. Of, brothel a, scene. Take your pick out of uncomfortableness here. There's also, like, the poor phrasism aspects, which are, of course, fantasy, but still kind of uncomfortable. Also, the callous killing of civilians. The callous killing of civilians. This is just not a great episode for feeling comfortable. And, like, we're not quite at a point yet where the goblins are supposed to be people, but... Oh. I mean, just in terms of internal consistency, they are depicted as people later on, so we have to assume that like they might not have been considered people at this point in time. But they then... are depicted as running for their lives. That's true. So yeah, I'm uncomfortable with it. So is this like a full, full out scale negative five? Mm, I'm I'm leaning towards a negative four, but it could be a negative five. A negative four because we don't know, like, we don't want to completely drain this pool yet. Yes, we, <laughs> we will have a rock bottom. Don't worry about it. We're not sure whether this is rock bottom yet. It might be. But for now, we are at a total of negative 3.5. Lovely. Wonderful. Role-playing realness, which is what the R stands Role for. Role-playing realness. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what to say about this. Not a lot of it happening, really. Like, there was just... There were there weren't very many character interactive moments that we could count towards this. I mean, I'm going to give points for the comment cards, because I'm very fond of that role-playing decision. And also, I'm just very fond of yes, Percy and okay. Cleveland. And to be fair, nobody actually shot, shot down any role-play, so that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give this one medium points, I think. Maybe like a two. Okay, yeah, I'm, I can work with a two. That's a total negative of uh, 1.2? Yeah. 1.5. V stands for vexiness. How do you feel about the vexiness of this episode, Yana? I was actually surprised by how much there was. Vex is in very good form this episode. She gets quite a few moments and quite a few things going. Arrival at Craghammer, comma, a surprising amount of vexiness. <laughs> but no, I agree. I agree completely. Yes. Like, I mean, okay... We're not in the parentheses part yet, as we have established before. This isn't shippy yet. But just the vex part of the vexiness is, well, solid, solid, like 2, 2.5 to get rid of the crummy ones. Yeah, yeah, I feel that way too. Which now puts us one point into the positives. Yay! I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. god, mm -hmm. I, I just really like vex. I think that uh, 
looking at this episode in retrospect and remembering watching campaign one episode one and just immediately being taken by vex this is very biased well, sorry this is is this is very biased but okay no lie mm-hmm. when um during the introduction, before the, they start playing, they go around the table introducing themselves. At some point, somebody's phone goes off or something. We hear weird music, and then Laura gets to introducing herself, and then it, then then it, then children start cheering in the background. I felt that. I felt that too. So, yeah. Also, she describes Vex as the coolest per- as the coolest chick alive, and like, yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. That's mm-hmm. what she is. Yes, objectively. So yeah, I'm willing to add another 0.5 to that to be up to 2.5 for Vexidus. Which makes us, which means we're now at one positive point. <laughs> okay, which we are going to take away soon, but don't worry. Uh, a. Oh yeah. Is for action. The action was fine. I'm, yeah. I mean, there was some uncomfortable civilian killing. And what even are rules? But other than that, it was fine. Yeah, I think that action isn't necessarily like a moralistic, like, who is being harmed by the action? It's just like, is this compelling? And it's fine. Like, I'm actually, I was leading towards a zero, but I would like to hear what you have yeah. to say, too. I feel a zero, is this is like the neutral ground. This is like the most generic fight scene you get. Yeah. Including all of the warnings we have for fight scenes. Yeah, yeah, I feel like this is... A- it had all of that. There's nothing specifically bad about this fight scene, but there's not just not very much good about it. It's a fight scene. It's this is the fight scene. It is a fight scene. Zero points. We're still at one point. Still at one point. Let's see if we can make it into the minuses. <laughs> yeah, we get to N, which is for nine cents. Who boysy? Which, if you haven't listened to a session zero, which you should have, is technically a little um. A little dumping on campaign two, but it's mostly just referring to, um, are they capable of sticking to a plot, or are we just getting lost in the shenanigans, or, or are the shenanigans any good with the talents about characters, or are they just abusing guards for an hour? Yeah, and uh, this one is, I would say, not as heavy on the lines as it could be, but fairly heavy on the line sense. It is definitely present here. Like, just the segment where everyone goes off and does random stuff. Mm-hmm. Or when, like, they forget, kind of, like, mid-argument, like, what they're arguing about. Yeah, they kind of forget the plot a lot. Yeah, they do, and they also forget that they're but... not <laughs> breaking the law. Yeah, they just see an extremely official and legal business. They do forget about that, and then they break into houses they didn't have to break into. Yes. Like, I mean, as... Some of this might probably just be because they're nervous that they are on stream. Yeah, that's true. That's why I'm, I'm not as willing to give them like a full, like negative three or negative four, but maybe like a negative one or a negative two. I'm all for a negative one. You think so? Yes. Is there any like any like neutralizing element of the nine cents that we can justify? They do remember the plot eventually and go do it, and then they get lost in the sauce again while trying to talk about the plot. Okay, yeah, that's fair. So negative. I want. I'm for. I'm for a negative one. Negative one. So we are at <laughs> round zero. We are at zero. <laughs> Which sums up how I felt about this episode. Watching it, yeah. it was perfectly fine, but a bit of a nothing burger. Yes, and again, zero is literally our. our not. It's not a bad score. It's the median score. <laughs> it's the literal There's median. There's five points more or five points less they could have gotten. This is the middle. This is very middle of the road. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that it's it's very much like a... Uh, it's not a bad episode. It's not a very good episode. It's just an episode. It's fine. In that way, I suppose, it is like a very good introduction. In that it is like a median sample. It is just like a middle-of-the-road sample of Critical Role. Yeah, yeah, this is the middle that's gonna get. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, the worst it's gonna get. <laughs> okay, so on the per round... But honestly, it kind of makes sense to be a little more gracious with the scores this early on, because this is, this is just... This is, they're, they're just starting out with this brand new format. Yes, we're trying to be very generous to them in the way that you are generous to, like, a toddler that gives you, like, a scribbly little drawing, and you're like, good job, kid. Or to randos on the internet who thought they could just record a podcast. That's true. We hope that you are as gracious to us as you, as you are to... Uh, little small children who give you a, a crumpled piece of paper with some crayon drawings on it. 
Because this is what this is. We did this for you. Because we really like Critical Role very much. Sort of. So we made art of it. We do. You kind of have to you have to love a thing a lot to devote this much time to talking about it. Yes, especially when it's an episode that you don't particularly feel strongly about. Yes. <laughs> I'm really excited to see what comes next. I know that this episode is, is very much like not very many strong emotions, but like knowing how much is to come, I'm excited. Me too, I'm excited. I'm also excited for this project to continue. Yeah. Speaking of this project, yeah. if you would like to give us your money for whatever reason... We have a Patreon account if you want to pledge your allegiance to us regularly. You're not obligated to. We're fine. You better pay Lulafia for some art that's like... Oh yeah, yeah. please check out Lulafia. Uh, the song that was used for our introduction, our outro, and our transitions was uh, Red Fox Tavern by Current Sun, which is available for free use as long as it is credited. So thank you very much for allowing us to use this song. Here we are crediting you. Thanks. And also thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you to you, audience. Thank you, dear listener, for sticking with us for however long this took. Yeah, and we appreciate you listening to the very first episode of our podcast, the very first non-zero episode of this podcast. We would appreciate you following us on the Twitter, on the Tumblr. Are we going to make a Facebook for this? I don't want to make a Facebook for this. I don't want to make this. a Facebook for this. Maybe we're going to make either. a Facebook for this. <laughs> Is anyone ever still on Facebook? I don't think so. But we hope that you join us. Okay, on the Twitter and on the Tumblr. The Twitter and the Tumblr, which are available also on Critical Rollback. Um, we will have further links in the description. And we hope that you join us uh, next time for the next episode of Critical Rollback. Uh, my name is Bong. I'm Yana. And we still don't have an outro. This has been our podcast. This has been our podcast. And here's some outro music. Bye!